from the first part of the sermon it was talking about the Christ it compared the Lord with lots of things like the angels Moses and priests the first thing it said was the Christ was above all those guys there's no doubt that he was God and He doesn't say a word to the chattering mouths around him. What he did is he woke up, <clears throat> excuse me, and he spoke to the situation. And he said, peace be still. And, all the, and it said that the wind died down and everything became calm. As we go, and basically what I believe it's teaching us is that we go through life, no matter what storms come against us, no matter how hard the wind blows, we just need to be, speak to the situation and be asleep in the boat. And I want to sing a song for you this morning. There's a storm on the horizon. Oh, let the wind blow. There is thunder in the heavens. Oh, let the wind blow. Let the rain fall down from the sky above. Let the tempest roar till it's had enough. I'm trusting in the Lord of oh Lord. Let the wind There is lightning in the distance, oh, let the wind blow. There is darkness all around me, oh, let the wind blow. Let the world give all the hurt it can. Let the evil one devise his plan. I'm trusting in
Amen, Joe. Whoa. The wind was blowing, almost knocked me out of that pew, Joe. Wow. I didn't know that could come out of you. <laughs> Woo. The Lord, it's amazing. The talent that we come out of the church. Wow. Incredible. Woo. Man. God is so good. Take your Bibles with me. This seems a little loud. Turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 9. And if you have a pew Bible, if you want to use the pew Bible, that's page 1104. It's been a long time since we've been in Hebrews. It was before Christmas. Did a little Christmas. We did a couple of Christmas series and passed the Sam with Jack. So it's like, whoa, Hebrews, where was that coming from? But remember the book of Hebrews was written to the Hebrews to tell the Hebrews to stop living like Hebrews. That's easy to get. In other words, it's a book, it's an apologetic book. It is presenting Christ that is superior to everything. Superior to angels, superior to Moses, superior to the law of the Old Testament covenant, superior to the priesthood. Now talking about the Old Testament tabernacle, we're going to tell us today about a perfect tent, which his body was given for us. And so he's little by little hitting every area of Judaism to, sell, to teach the people that Christ is superior and better than everything that they experienced, and that he fulfills all the Old Testament scriptures. But the key thing is that he was the Messiah and that his sacrifice on the cross was perfect that gives eternal salvation. And in chapter 9, we're dealing with this issue of the tabernacle of the Old Testament and the, and the New. The Old Covenant versus the New Covenant. And so he comes and he's bringing this tremendous this uh, appeal, this uh, apologetic debate that carries on. And the ultimate goal is to get people who are sitting on the fence in a small church and somewhere in the area of Rome which we believe was a majority of a Jewish congregation, there were people who didn't cross over yet. They have not accepted and claimed Christ as the Messiah and received the forgiveness, and they're sitting on the fence. They're in the middle, and he's saying, don't go back. And he warns them a couple of times. There's warning passages. He says, don't go back, because there's, you go back, there's no more sacrifice for sins. Don't go back. The old, old law, the old covenant is not going to do it. Don't go back. Go forward and accept Christ. And that's the whole appeal going on here. This book is written around 64 AD, maybe 64, before 64, 66. We're not exactly clear. We're not exactly clear on even who wrote this book. But what's happening, and they don't know this, but we know this, knowing history that's taking place, in 70 AD, the temple in Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. The diaspora, which means the dispersion of the Jews, will happen, and the Jews will be spread through the utmost parts of the earth and have been that way since 1948 when they had a, a land that was given back to them and the rebirth of the land of Israel. We're talking a lot about blood in this passage. When you think about it, that's a pretty gory thing. I remember when I first came to Christ, but I, 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 to understand this, I, brought up, I was brought up in a Catholic background, and I knew much that blood is very much associated with Christianity. From the very beginning of time, after Adam and Eve sinned, blood began to be an object lesson of the awfulness of sin. And God began to teach in the garden that an innocent victim would have to cover and take the place of human sin. And God did that by providing skins to cover Adam and Eve. The first death in the Bible was animals died for a sinful man. And then it went on to the next chapter. We see the death of Abel by Cain and death and bloodshed on and on. And God providing the object lesson and the lesson to be learned that for an innocent, for a, excuse me, for a sinful person to come in the presence of God, he must have a perfect sacrifice to be taken in his place. Someone had an innocent victim had to take and cover the sinful person's sin. Thus we have all these animal sacrifices. Okay. K 
Kent Hughes, one of my favorite commentators, preacher, I heard him many, many times. He was talking about when he was a student in college, he recalled with some uncommon vividness his English professor expressing amusement, horror, and mocking the lines of William, William Cowper's hymn. You'll know the song. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Kent goes on to say that for the next few minutes, the professor condescendingly reflected on these primitive sentiments, saying, swimming in a fountain of blood, dog paddling among the clots, which was getting eliciting laughs from the class, which was still, those evidences were still prevalent in restoration in Augustan English, he said. The prof used such phrases as slaughterhouse religion. And the Bible thumpers believe this. I could feel myself being flushed as crimson as the despised fountain. But as an outsider, and the professor was definitely an outsider, he did have a point. Because the Old Testament sacrificial system, which provides the prefigurement for Christ's sacrifice, was a gory affair indeed. During the thousand years plus of the Old Testament, there were more than a million animal sacrifices. Think of that. So considering that each bull sacrifice spilled a gallon or two of blood, and each goat a quart, the Old Testament truly rested on a sea of blood. During the Passover, for example, a trough was constructed from the temple down into the Kidron Valley for the disposal of blood, a sacrificial plumbing system. Why the perpetual sea of blood? For one main reason, to teach that sin demands the shedding of blood. This in no way suggests that blood itself atones for sins. Otherwise, sacrifices could have been bled rather than killed. Just hook up an IV and let the blood come out. No, that's not it. But it demonstrates that sin both brings and demands death. Death. Steaming blood provided the sign, even the smell of the old covenant that backs. Think of it. Sin brings death. Sin brings death. Sin brings death. And because of that, God required the shedding of blood and the death of an innocent and victim to cover our sins. But now, praise the Lord in this passage, the writer of Hebrews is saying, Christ is the final fulfillment. He is the lamb that was shed and slain, shed his blood once for all, once for all, for our sins. It is finished. It's over. We don't sacrifice Jesus anymore. We don't have to go to a sacrificial or a religious system as some churches do today to do a Eucharistic bleeding of Jesus every week. Bring him down from heaven, so to speak. And somehow we have a hocus-pocus power to turn these elements into blood, into bread, into a body. No, no, no. That's cannibalism. And that Jesus never intended that. It's symbolism. He said these are spirit and truth. He died once for all for our sins. So as we go into our passage here, we want to see the greater and more perfect tent. And we're kind of reviewing here because we, we actually finished have part of this already. The old covenant with its earthly tent is superseded by the new covenant with its heavenly tent. And it's inaugurated by the once for all perfect sacrifice of our high priest Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? This is victory. This is, this is a hallelujah for us. Religion says you got to keep working. Religion is different from biblical Christianity. Religion means you, it has a base English word is to climb a ladder. The word that came from that we have to climb, try to reach God. 
by going to the next rung of somehow pleasing him, go to the next rung of doing good deeds or trying to do good works and trying to get to the next level, to the next level, to get higher and higher. I guess, friends, you'll never get high on that ladder. You can never. It would be like trying to put a ladder between the earth and the moon. You won't do it. Christ came from heaven to this earth to provide everything there was for us because we as sinful men could do nothing to earn the favor and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we saw that the in, inferior old covenant sanctuary, that's what he does in the first, in, in the first 10 verses. And, and just we're going to go quickly and read from the text. Basically, he's showing us there are five reasons why the Old Testament sanctuary, the old sanctuary was inferior. When we talk about the old sanctuary, we're talking about the temple and the tabernacle. Predominantly, we're talking about the tabernacle, which was the first thing that God set up to teach the people of Israel how to approach a holy God. For a sinful man to come into the presence of God, the closest they could experience that was to do this little earthly tent tabernacle thing and to set up a priesthood and this whole ritualistic thing to try to get a sinful person to be able to come and approach God with a sacrifice with the idea of appeasing, satisfying a holy God. And what a system it was. It was unbelievable. Man, I thank God that I, would, I wasn't born and lived under that day and age. So the first thing we see here, five, five reasons why the old sanctuary, the tabernacle, was in fear. First, it was an earthly sanctuary. It's earthly. It's not a heavenly one. Verse 1 says, now the first covenant also had regulations for ministry and an earthly tabernacle or an earthly sanctuary. The word earthly there, basically, the idea there basically means earthly. It's, it's mundane. It's corrupt. It's worldly. It's fleshly. It's of this world. So right there, it's inferior. It's inferior by even the products that it made. It's made by man. It's not made by God. God gave the instruction to do that. But that's why it's inferior. It's earthly. Also, it was a type of something greater. This earthly tabernacle was a reflection of something greater. We saw already in the book of Hebrews, and we'll see it again, it's referred to as a shadow. These are a shadow of things to come. Remember, I explained the word type. It's a typology. A type is a, it's like a, when you're minting a coin, uh, when you come down and press a coin and press an image, the, type, the picture is, is a, it leaves an imprint. It's a type reflecting the true. Like when we have coins that have George Washington or your quarter. That's not George Washington. It's an imprint of his face on there. The true George Washington, hopefully he's in heaven if he's a Christian, but that's the true. The coin is the type. And this is type of the future. It was something greater. Verse 2 through 5. Read that with me. It says, uh, for a tabernacle was set up in the first room, which is called the holy place, and there were a lampstand, the table, and the presentation loaves. Behind the second, that is the curtain, the tabernacle was called the most holy place. It contained the gold altar of incense, the Ark of the Covenant, covered with gold on all sides, in which there was a gold jar containing the manna, <clears throat> Aaron's staff that budded, and the tables of the covenant. The cherubim of glory were above, overshadowing the mercy seat. It is not possible to speak about these things in detail right now. So the writer says, listen, this is what the first tabernacle was like. All these physical things are a type of the future. And he talks about in the tabernacle, there was an outer room, the holy place. And then there was the most holy place behind the veil, which is called the Holy of Holies. What's interesting here is uh, there's sometimes some confusion because it talks about having the golden altar of incense. It sounds like the golden altar of incense is inside the Holy of Holies. But what it means here, it was uh, obvious as being a type of something greater. The scriptures say, for example, right here, if you look, these are the articles. Outside, this is the side that, that the priest came, and there was a brazen altar where, some, where you would take and offer your sacrifice. The labor was this big bath of water where the priests had to constantly cleanse themselves and wash. All these, there was all kinds of washings for them. But then when you came into the first entrance into the holy place, there was a golden lampstand, with, which, was, which was based with olive oil that was replenished, and those were continually burning. 
talking about that Israel, the reminder, should be the light of the world. Then we had this table of showbread, we'll call it the table of presence. There were 12 loaves representing the 12 tribes of Israel, and they made fresh loaves every week. And only the priests were allowed to eat that. And again, reminding us about the manna which God provided for Israel. In fact, the fact that we're going to, re the reflection of the type of Christ, who is the bread of life. Then the altar of, excuse me, the altar of incense was right here. Now, according to this, it sounds like the altar of incense is inside. How would we correct this? Is it true? Is it a mistake? Well, scholars have been puzzled over this for a long time to try to find, doesn't the scripture place the golden of incense? Is it on the inside or the outside of the holy holies? Well, it has to be on the outside because in Exodus 36, it says that it's in the holy place on the outside. In fact, the priests in Exodus 30, verse 7 and 8, they have to minister every day at the altar of incense. They have to put incense, in, and they use this. So they are not allowed. The only one person in all of Israel is allowed to go into that holy of holies, and that's the high priest. And he only goes in once a year on the day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. But the priest every day minister at the altar. What happens is we find out that this altar of incense is right but up to this veil. It's, and sometimes it is basically saying it's in the veil, but it's not. Interesting. This, so why does the author of Hebrews present the altar of incense as part of the most holy place? Leon Morris, a commentator, I think does a good job in trying to explain. He says, the author has in mind the intimate connection of the incense altar with the most holy place. There's an intimate connection between the two. So it, as it says in 1 Kings, well, by the way, there's a picture that where, that where the altar is. It's right in front of the opening where the temple is. And that most scholars will believe it's right there in the middle, almost before entering the temple. So what Morris says over in 1 Kings 6, 20, 6, uh, 1 Kings, well, it says, as you are to place the altar in front of the veil by the ark of the testimony, in front of the mercy seat that is over the testimony where I will meet with you. It sounds like it's inside, but it's not. Exodus 45 says, place the golden altar, for instance, in front of the ark of the testimony, put up the screen of the entrance to the tabernacle. And it sounds like that. But here is a clarification. In 1 Kings 6.22, it belonged to the innocent as shown by the... It's, it says here, so he added the golden overlay to the entire temple until everything was completely finished, including the entire altar that belongs to the inner tank sanctuary. The idea is that it belongs to the sanctuary, not necessarily geographically, it's inside. And so this is what, so what the Hebrew word means, belongs to, associated with, in a close proximity. And so the idea here is uh, the essence of the, it's puzzling, but basically it's tip, tip, the typology is prophesied in, what, in Christ, in our prayers to the, to, for, into the Holy of Holies. And so, that gives some clarification. The typology is significant. It's not, for example, for the intense prophecies of the ultimate prayer offered by Christ, our high priest, in the presence of God. And so incense is always a representation of our prayer life. And specifically here, the picture and typology is Christ offering as our high priest our prayers for us every day. But let's not get so sidetracked on that because I think it's basically a matter of the, of the words in the Hebrew. The third thing is we see here, another reason why the old sanctuary was inferior was it was impossible. It was inaccessible to the people of God. There was no access. Look at verse 6 and 7. Verse 6 and 7 says this, With these things set up this way, the priest entered the first room repeatedly, performing their ministry. But the high priest alone enters the second room, and he does that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. So here again, we see that, that it's, it's inaccessible to people. And it's a, it has an even a limited efficacy, meaning it doesn't affect. What's interesting, the commentators point out that this says the sins that were brought into the Holy Holies on the Yom Kippur are only what they call trespass offerings. It means offerings that are done in ignorance. It's, it's or in your translation, it says he goes, offers for himself, first sins, and then for the unintentional sins of people in ignorance. Wow. So if someone who purposely, knowingly, 
rebelliously sins, there is no forgiveness of sins. Listen, Numbers 15, verse 30 through 31 says this, but the person who acts defiantly, whether native or foreign resident, he blasphemes the Lord. That person is to be cut off from his people. He will certainly be cut off because he has despised the Lord's word and broken his commands. His guilt remains on them. So there's a seriousness when you purposely and willfully reject God's word and sin intentionally, you're to be cut off from the people in the Old Testament. Cut off meant the death penalty. And there's a whole series of things that the Old Testament law says. You sin, you're dead. You sin, you die. You're to be cut off. Cut off. There wasn't the absolute, oh, let's go to the tabernacle and see if we can get you. No, there was no forgiveness. Sad when you think about that. Only unintentional sins. But praise God in our great high priest, Lord Jesus, he comes and forgives all sins. Even your rebellious, intentional sins and the ones that you know you did, praise God for that. Inaccessible. It was people had no access to forgiveness. The efficacy of the sins forgiven was limited. That's the old system. Numbers, I I just quoted this. Cut off from the people if you intentionally. The word is a high, this is the idea of high crimes and misdemeanors. The phrase that it says defiantly means a high crime in God's eyes. To willfully, willfully disobey was a capital offense. The inferior old covenant, number four, it was temporary. Verse eight, it was temporary. Praise God, he never meant this to be permanent. Verse 8 says, by this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy of places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic of the present age. As long as that was up, and that was temporary. Temporary. As I said earlier, sadly, not too far from now, in 70 AD, that temple, that tabernacle, that earthly representation of how to go through the system is going to be destroyed. And God was preparing that Jesus Christ is the only way to go approach God from that point out. There hasn't been a temple. There hasn't been a way for the Jews to go in the sacrificial system to God for over 2,000 years. To this day, they want to build a temple. There's great intrigue going on in the middle of, of, of Israel right now to build the temple. The whole process of what's going on on the Temple Mount, every day there's a group called the Temple Mount Faithful have everything in order. They're ready to go. They're ready to start. They have priests already lined up. They have everything made, all the implements, all the clothing, all the ephod, the linen, all the implements to go into the temple. They're ready to go. The only thing they don't have is the Ark of the Covenant. But God hasn't done that. Why? Because Jesus Christ is our Ark. Jesus Christ is our final sacrifice. He is our Messiah. For 2,000 years, we've been trying to preach the gospel, the good news. Then the last thing, why the inferiority of this old covenant. Its ministry was external, not internal. It's only external. You can go through all the motions. Religion, you can go through all the motions of religion. You can do the, say the right things, say the right prayers, do what they tell you to do. But that doesn't mean it's inside you internally. That's what religion is. It's hypocritical. You have to have that. To be born again means you have to have the Holy Spirit work in your heart and life by faith. You see that you're a sinner, and what you need to do is before God says, I'm a sinner, woe is me, for I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. I'm filthy, dirty. I cannot approach you. I deserve your judgment. And in knowing that, you say, Lord, please, I'm willing to repent and turn, and I want to trust the only way that I can be saved, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for my sins. I do that. I receive that by faith. That's, how, that's salvation. Nothing complicated. It's, not, it is, it's just faith, simple childlike faith. Believe that Jesus Christ was your sacrifice once for all for your sins. Died, paid the punishment for your sins. Satisfied a holy God. He offers you salvation. If you haven't done that, do it today. Don't delay. That's not religion. That's Christianity. Christ and Christ alone. I love it. And then the superiority, I'm just going to run through this real quick, the superiority of the heavenly sanctuary. We see there are five reasons why the new sanctuary is superior. First, it's heavenly. Verse 11, look down at verse, it's heavenly. Verse 11, 
but that when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, even though the greater and more perfect tent had not made with hands, that is, not this creation, praise God. Once for all, we, we have a heavenly sanctuary. We were reading, uh, Jim was reading from a Revelation uh, chapter 4 and chapter 5 about the heavenly scene. That's the heavenly scene of the new sanctuary where the sea of like glass and the glow of beautiful colors and, and, and all that's going place in heaven. That's the new sanctuary. It's heavenly. It's not down here. All these furnishings, furnishings are just temporal. We don't have a temple down here, you know. The most, probably the most religious article that we have of furniture here is this communion table. It's just a table that reminds us of where we have communion once a month. It's holy in a sense. It's set apart for a purpose use. We don't come here and eat our lunch in here. At least we haven't yet, Mary. But <laughs> no, we, this is set apart for communion. That's what holy means. Set apart for a specific purpose. Set apart today for have communion. But the heavenly, oh, that's where it's at. We don't, so, we don't, so some churches, you'll go into denominational church, different denominations, and you will see religious artifacts and stuff. That's all gone. There's no more furnishings. The furniture has been moved, been taken out. We don't come through the veil. We don't come through the table of showbread. We don't have candelabras. We don't have candles burning. We don't do any of that stuff. Why? It's, all, it's done. It's finished. It's gone. Very simple. Very simple. That's religious artifacts, religious things. Secondly, its ministry is effective to deal with sin. Verses 12 through 14, I love it. 12 through 14 says this. <clears throat> he entered once for all into the Holy of Holies, not by means of blood of goats or calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. Do you get that? His blood that he presented into the holy of holies in heaven secures, grabs hold of, takes place, eternal, eternal redemption. My friends, it's something you don't, can't lose. We believe very firmly here at Niagara Frontier Bible Church, the Bible teaches you're eternally secure. God is able to save you and to keep you and there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not even yourself. Now, you may be duped or deceived yourself that you may not know the Lord, and some people really don't know. But if you are truly a child of God, you have eternal, secure redemption. I love it. I love it. Christ is our mediator and testator. Look, 15. It says here, how, uh, let's look at verse 14. How much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The Old Testament covenant could not clear your conscience. You had to keep going back day after day, month after month, year after year. You had to get another animal. You had to keep going and going and going. And, and, and your conscience was not clear. Christ, because of his once for all sacrifice, clears our conscience for all. I could come every day before God says, thank you, Lord, that you already forgave the sin that I committed today or the one I'm going to do this week. It was already paid and punished. It was already taken care of in Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago. Because when Christ died on the cross, he knew about me even though I wasn't born 2,000 years. And an eternal, omnipotent, powerful God was able to take my punishment on that cross 2,000 years ago. And I could have the faith and confidence and a clear conscience to know all my sins were paid for, the judgment and condemnation that I deserve has been taken care of, and I could come before God in confession and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you did in sacrificing your son for my sins and that you already paid the penalty. I'm forgiven of all my sins. You've cleansed me from all unrighteousness, and I can walk in confidence and strength and faith to keep going with a clear conscience. Do you have a clear conscience? Ask yourself, do you have a clear conscience? The majority of people who are in, in mental asylums and com, who are taking pills and for depression and antidepressants and, and on it goes and the suicide is because they do not have a clear conscience. They don't know what it is to stand before God and know the freedom and the wonderful power of forgiveness. Oh man, it's so awesome. Now I just want to close quickly here because our time has run out, but... I was reading an awesome story about a doctor 
from England. He, lived, he worked in a rural area, he was a rural doctor, and he was noted for his professional skill and his devotion to Christ. After his death, his books were ex examined. The ledger. Several entries had written across them in red ink. Forgiven. Crossed out. Forgiven. Too poor to pay. Another one. Forgiven. Too poor to pay. Unfortunately, his wife was of a different disposition. Insisting that these debts be settled, she filed a lawsuit before the proper court. When the case was heard, the judge asked her, is this your husband's handwriting in red? She replied that it was. Then, said the judge, not a court in the land can touch those whom he has forgiven. Friends, our Lord Jesus Christ is, took, took a red marker of his blood and wiped it across your account saying, sinner, unable to pay ever, forgiven by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, you're forgiven. Believe it. Accept it. Live like you're free and clear conscience and you'll be free. No more depression. No more sadness. Only love and wanting to share the good news with other people. I opened up with the, with the uh, illustration. Try to go forward here. Oh, back too much. Here it is. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. And sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day, and there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Friends, your sins are washed away. Believe it, accept it, live in that freedom. Let's pray. Father, Glory be to you, Lord. To you alone belongs the glory, Father, for this wonderful salvation. You pleaded with these people in Rome, who are mostly Jewish people, to step from one side to the other, to accept and to grab hold of Jesus Christ as their Messiah. You are asking the same thing to be done today. There are people still sitting on the fence, still on the other side, still thinking religion is going to save them, still thinking their merit or their works or somehow good deeds can get them to you to, be, to make you feel happy with them. No, Lord, we're all sinners and come short of the glory of God. Thank you, Lord, that you provided everything for us on Calvary's cross. It's once for all, done, finished. The veil of the tent has been written, all rent from top to bottom. The Bible says here that it's the veil of Jesus' flesh. He's into the, he went through the holy of holies into heaven, and he, we have now have eternal redemption. Lord, today, may someone in this room who hasn't accepted that call out to you in simple faith, Lord, I believe. Receive me. Save my soul today. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. You see, I've been through the letter from a source with no name. It fell in between Paul's words and James. And the experts, they can't tell whence that it came. But the ancient ones called it Hebrews by name. La, la, la.